Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, or TOPS. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm Clara Ma, a postdoctoral uh, research fellow at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. TOPS is organized by Mike Pestro at the University of Missouri, C. Shang at the, at the Ohio State University, Michael Darden at Johns Hopkins University, and Jamie Hartman Boyce at University of Massachusetts Amherst. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series gu guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your questions are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Jamie Hartman Boyce from the University of Massachusetts Amherst to introduce our speaker. Thanks so much, Claire. Today, we continue our summer 2024 season with a grand rounds presentation by Jim Thrasher entitled Cigarette Package Inserts for Enhanced Communication with Smokers. This presentation was selected via competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. Dr. Jim Thrasher is a professor in the Department of Health Promotion, Education and Behavior in the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina, as well as a researcher and visiting professor at the Mexican National Institute of Public Health. He focuses on tobacco control communication and policy interventions. Foundations and federal agencies around the world have funded his research program, which includes two decades of international research on product packaging and labeling. In recognition of his significant impact on the science and policies for tobacco product labeling, Dr. Thrasher received the World Health Organization's World No Tobacco Day Award in 2016. Dr. James Harden, a professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina, is a co-author of the studies and will help by answering select questions in the Q&A. Dr. Thrasher, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you so much. Um... I want to make sure that I can get my screen on here. All right. All right. Is that looking like it's supposed to? I get a thumbs up. Looks great. Yep. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to talk about this um, study, which is funded by the, the National Cancer Institute. We're uh, about done, uh, but we have a number of papers that I'm going to be discussing today that came out of the first phase of this study. Um, as I mentioned, the study was funded by the National Cancer Institute, although the views reflected here on the content that I present is um, reflective of my and my author's um, um, inputs and does not reflect the official views of the National Institutes of Health. I've also served as an expert witness on behalf of governments and litigation brought by the tobacco industry. Um, and receive funding from tobacco control advocacy organizations, though I have not received funding from pharmaceutical companies or tobacco companies. All right, so inserts. Um, you know, the tobacco industry has used cigarette package inserts to communicate with smokers for over a century. Um, nevertheless, uh, Canada is the only country in the world ha that has used that particular strategy for trying to communicate with smokers. And we know that the Food and Drug Administration has a regulatory power to adopt inserts for communicating with smokers. In fact, there's some specifications in the act that gave the FDA regulatory power over cigarettes that specifically focus on the issue of using inserts to communicate with smokers. Um, so can't, many people don't realize this, but Canada was the first country to uh, adopt and implement pictorial warnings on cigarette packs, which you know raise anxiety, raise negative affect um, related to the harms of smoking. But those messages are complemented by information inside of packs, what I would call efficacy messages that focus on the benefits of quitting and um, that provide uh, tips for cessation, including information about where people can find more resources if they're interested in quitting. And those messages, like the pictorial warnings, are rotating across the packs. There are eight different messages that were rotating across packs from 2012 until the beginning of this year. Um, and according to theory and empirical evidence, this kind of combination of fear arousing, pictorial warnings, illustrating the harmful consequences of smoking, 
with efficacy messaging is um, the most likely messaging strategy to maximize the effects of a particular communication. And so Canada has been doing that, but is the only country in the world to have done so, so far. Um, in some early work we did a number of years ago, um, taking advantage of some cohorts, an open cohort of uh, Canadian smokers that we um, uh, surveyed every four months over the course of a couple of years. Um, we ran some mediation models where we tried to separate out the effects of reading inserts from the effects of reading and attending to the warning labels that were on the packs. This was all after the policy had been implemented, observational and correlational, although had this longitudinal component to it. But our data suggested that it was really the frequency of reading inserts that was most strongly associated with quitting attempts, including sustained quitting attempts that lasted 30 days or more. Um, although the levels of exposure and engagement to inserts was significantly lower than what it is that we saw for, for the warning labels. And so this kind of gave us the, um, the ammo that we needed to try and build some more studies around this idea of how can we use efficacy messaging inside of PACS to enhance the impact of pictorial warnings. And it, another piece of all this, as I mentioned before, is that there is a particular uh, mandate for the FDA that involves communication via inserts. And you're probably aware of the other kinds of inserts that often are included in packaging for products, consumer products that FDA regulates. Um, but one of the things that I worked on with Eric Lindblom and Micah Burden, Berman in a um, paper that we published in Food and Drug Law Journal is how one of the nice things about inserts is that they overcome some of the concerns that are related to the First Amendment issues that have uh, that the industry has used to block implementation of pictorial warnings on the outside of PACs. In other words, inserts are inside and so are not communicating information to all potential consumers. And because they're inside and can target the consumer who has already purchased the, the pack, it can avoid some of the concerns about compelled speech that the industry has used to um, effectively delay implementation of pictorial warnings for over 12 years now. Um, so we've done a number of different studies, qualitative and quantitative, experimental and other, to try and hone our thinking about which of these um, insert messages would be most likely to be helpful for smokers who try to quit. Um, and then we got funding for the, the randomized control trial that I'll be spending most of my time talking about today, which is essentially a two by two between subject trial where adult smokers who smoked at least 10 cigarettes a day were randomized to one of the four conditions that you see on the right. Um, we have the control group, which is the standard health warning labels, 50% of the side of cigarette packs. Although the content of those messages was drawn from the, the act that gave FDA regulatory authority over tobacco, kind of four rotating messages that are novel um, compared to the messages that have been on packs since 1984. Um, so there is a novelty element in the messaging for our control group. Um, but then we have a group that got those same messages on the side of the packs, but supplemented with inserts inside of the packs. And the content of those messages had to do with um, strategies for building self-efficacy to quit or tips to quit. Um, and then emphasizing some of the benefits, both health and financial of cessation. So again, working the, the lines that, that um, Canada has been working in their policy um, uh, around labeling as well as reflective of kind of theory and empirical evidence about which types of messaging would be the best complement to the fear rousing pictorial warnings. Um, and you can see the other groups that we had um, to which people could have been randomly assigned were pictorial um, warnings only or the pictorial warning plus the, the um, insert. And so we provided all of our participants with a 14-day supply of their preferred cigarette brands and modified the packs to reflect the experimental condition to which they've been uh, assigned. And um, one of the uh, uh, innovations of this study was around the data collection, which used ecological momentary assessment. So we asked all of the participants to log every single cigarette that they smoked across the 14-day period of this study. Um, and then we use an algorithm that was based on the number of cigarettes that they told us that they usually smoked each day at the beginning of the study before they were randomized to their condition. 
and use that to um, uh, generate surveys that they answered after uh, logging four or five of the cigarettes that they smoked. We didn't want people who were smoking 20 cigarettes, 40 cigarettes a day to be answering 20 to 40 surveys because of concerns about burden. So we had this algorithm built in to limit the number of surveys that people could be queried, um, uh, could be could be asked um, each day. And then at the end of each day, they provided some evening reports. And I'll get into some of the measures that are in each of those different surveys here in a moment. But you can see in the picture that's in the middle there, kind of what, what a package looked like if it included both the pictorial warning on the outside and the insert on the inside. And again, people were given the, the brand variety, a 14-day supply of the brand variety that they preferred. Uh, another important component of this study is that uh, with my colleague Jeff Niederdepi at Cornell, we had um, outreach efforts to do intercept recruitment in New York. Um, in a variety of different uh, medium-sized cities uh, across the state where we would take this mobile lab to um, uh, the parking lot of a, a tobacco shop, a smoke shop that had been identified as being in a um, relatively disadvantaged area around the city. And we engaged in intercept recruitment and enrolled people into the study right then and there as they were kind of going to buy their cigarettes. And we found that in general, the recruitment, this intercept recruitment method worked pretty well. The data quality was similar to, but a little bit lower than what it is that we got with traditional voluntary recruitment, where we were posting flyers and advertising the study through social media, and people would have to come into our lab in order to be able to get the orientation and to receive the study materials. But in general, we found this as a very promising strategy for um, trying to recruit some hard to reach populations and, and found that to be helpful also in making sure that we had disadvantaged populations included in our study. Um, this is, uh, I'm not gonna get into the weeds here around uh, the sample composition, but you can see the number of people that we had in each of the treatment groups ranging from 87 to 101 and what the sociodemographic characteristics were for the sample. Um, I'll just highlight that we had about 42% of the uh, population who had a high school education or less. Um, some of that was due to some of the, we didn't get as many as we thought. We were gonna, thought we were gonna have at least 50%, but COVID kind of messed with that. But when you look at the income distribution, you see most people are kind of clustered at the lower end of the, the income distribution. So we feel like we did a pretty good job of getting to the, um, the uh, more disadvantaged populations and recruiting them. Um, and then when we look at some of the smoking characteristics, again, we said that uh, we had as a minimum number of cigarettes per day, 10 cigarettes per day. Um, part of the rationale for that was to ensure that we were giving people enough cigarettes that they were gonna be exposed multiple times to the messages that we were um, including inside of the cigarette packs. Um, but the other thing that I think is important is that in general, the smokers were kind of heavier smokers and they were less likely to intend to quit or to have engaged in a quit attempt in the last 12 months compared to the, the general population. So we tend to have heavier smokers, those who are less interested in smoking, not just compared to other uh, studies that have been in the space of warning label research, but also when compared to the general population. But in general, the randomization worked there were no statistically significant differences across the different treatment groups. All right, so measurement. Um, I mentioned before, we asked people to uh, log all of their cigarettes using a, a study provided phone, uh, and then four or five times a day, that would be followed by a brief survey. Um, and you can see here the different questions that we'll look at the outcomes for here in a moment, but the idea is that this is kind of a mix of questions that include some um, outcomes that are tied to the content of the inserts, some outcomes that are tied to the content of the, the warning labels, and then others that are more general like uh, motivation to quit. Um, the other thing that I think is important to emphasize here is that the reason why we decided to use this data collection approach was that um, at the moment of smoking, is when people were most likely to be exposed to the messaging on the packs, and so we, had some preliminary data to support this kind of a strategy. And um, this felt like it was important for us to get in there in real time and collect data at those moments that are most likely to reflect times when people were exposed to the messaging. Um, in addition to that, we had an evening survey. Um, people were prompted at the end of each day to um, 
provide us with data um, on these different constructs that you see here, most of which refer to the last 24 hours. How often did you think about smoking harms? How often did you think about cessation benefits? Um, how likely are you to get a serious disease um, if you continue smoking? Talking about smoking harms or cessation benefits is another interesting um, outcome variable because across a number of studies and countries, talking about messaging is associated with um, subsequent cessation attempts. And so is a, a nice behavioral proxy for that. Same thing for stubbing out cigarettes or foregoing cigarettes. Um, and we, we combine the stubbing out or, or foregoing cigarettes into a single indicator of either stubbing out cigarettes that um, the, they uh, put out before they finished it or not having a um, cigarette that they normally would have smoked. Again, because there is data to show that that kind of a, a measure or that kind of a behavior is associated with subsequent cessation. And one of the main limitations that we had in this study is that we only had 14 days to collect the data. We weren't collecting data over long periods of time that would be necessary to really look at cessation attempts. Um, but, and, and it was not feasible for us to do so given this, the intensive nature of the data collection. Um, all right, so analysis. I imagine some of you all are gonna be interested in this more than others, but um, my uh, colleague, Dr. James Harden is on board who has been the, the statistician for this work across the life of the project. And he can respond to some of those more um, nuanced questions around the anal analysis approach. But we um, estimated mixed effects, ordered and logistic models, adjusting for repeated measures because we had cigarette surveys that were nested within days, that were nested within individuals. Um, we had evening reports that were nested within individuals. And so we needed to control for all of that. Um, and you can see the equation that expresses, uh, that, that captures our kind of modeling and then the hypotheses that we were testing around insert effects and then also the pictorial warning effects. And there are two different ways in which the, the information um, is captured for the tests that we ran. But in general, the idea was that for insert effects, we were generalizing, did you get an insert or not? And then let's look at the outcome. And then for, for pictorial warnings, did you get a pictorial warning or not? Um, independent of whether they got the inserts um, um, uh, when we were evaluating the pictorial warnings. But then we had some supplementary analyses that allowed us to focus in a little more narrowly on this idea of, well, what happens when we compare people who just got an insert relative to um, our control packaging? Or what happens when people get a pictorial warning relative to our control packaging? Um, so we had these alternative hypotheses that we specified as well, although those were not specified in our clinicaltrials.gov um, application. And you can see there the number, and I'm happy to provide more information about that if anybody is interested. But the, the clinicaltrials.gov application was just about inserts, yes versus no, or pictorial warnings, yes versus no. Okay, so this is the, the, the result in general. Um, and so we're testing here this this hypothesis that exposure to PACs with inserts will result in stronger efficacy beliefs than PACs without inserts, which in turn will lead to stronger cessation-related outcomes, um, motivation to quit, interpersonal discussions about quitting, and foregoing slash stubbing out of cigarettes. And this line of uh, data that you see right here, each of the columns represents a different outcome that we assessed, different model for each outcome. And you can see the self-efficacy to quit, self-efficacy to cut down on cigarettes, feeling hopeful about quitting, um, the frequency of thinking about quitting benefits. All of those are tied to the content that we use inside of the, um, the insert um, messaging. Um, the motivation to quit, talking about um, cessation or harm and foregoing or stubbing out cigarettes are more general, kind of more distal outcomes. But you can see when you look at this that it's really just the frequency of thinking about quitting benefits and then the foregoing or stubbing out of cigarettes that end up popping up as being statistically significant. And when you adjust for multiple tests, which we could you know, have a discussion about whether that made it make sense to do that under this case where we have pre-specified hypotheses or not, but the, the only, the only um, outcome that turns out to be statistically uh, associated with uh, the insert exposure is the foregoing or stubbing out of cigarettes after adjustment for multiple tests. Um, what's interesting and I think important is that when we look at the, the kind of the pure contrast between inserts only relative to control, 
we see the same outcomes cropping up as being statistically significant. But the other thing that, that pops up is how the strength of the association increases. It doesn't cause something to become statistically significant, but it does go up in all cases. So the effect size goes up. And so here I have kind of the effect sizes laid out. And you can see that when we do that pure contrast of insert only relative to control, we start to get effects that are kind of medium to large effect sizes. So pretty large effects. The issue is, why aren't they statistically significant? Well, um, it turns out that the autocorrelation um, or the extent to which people's responses to the surveys varied was a lot lower, or that the interclass correlation coefficient was a lot higher than what it is that we had origin originally expected that it was going to be, um, and so that reduces re reduced some of our statistical power. So one of the things that I think comes out of this for anybody doing EMA research is pay attention to the ICCs, the autocorrelation um, for that the the kind of data that you want to analyze because it matters a lot with regard to the statistical power you'll have on the back end. Um, and we'll come back to that um, hopefully in the discussion. So um, a couple more slides and then we'll open it up for uh, uh, some discussion. The other component of this was focusing in on the pictorial warnings and how it is that exposure to pictures relative to smaller text only warnings on the side of the packs, how does that influence these outcomes? Again, we have arrayed here the kind of pictorial warning label specific outcomes that we thought of as being most tied to the, the content of that message. But once again, we found that foregoing or stubbing out of cigarettes was the only um, outcome that was associated with exposure to this message relative to the, the text only um, message that was much less prominent. Um, and again, we see the effect sizes and the ICC's um, effect sizes kind of going up when we strip out the people who were exposed to inserts and have kind of a, pure, a more pure contrast and then we also have this issue of relatively high ICCs that limit the additional statistical power that we could have gotten from repeated measures and that we had planned to get from repeated measures. Um, so this is my last slide before we'll take a little break and, and open it up for just some discussion. But you know, with regard to these main effects of the labeling conditions, the results were mostly null. Um, and this was consistent across the different sensitivity analyses that we ran based on different thresholds for determining data quality and compliance with the study protocol. In particular, the ICCs um, were higher than we had anticipated, which led to lower statistical power. Um, also, a potential mitigating factor is that compared to other randomized controlled trials in this space, um, we've had we had kind of heavier smokers and they were less interested in quitting. So they were more kind of dedicated to continuing to smoke and so maybe less likely to be influenced by the messaging. And there's you know, data to suggest that um, uh, that, that could be the case. Um, and then the insert effects were limited to foregoing and stubbing out um, after adjustment for um, the multiple testing issue. And um, the interesting thing about that is that was probably our strongest um, kind of proxy for future cessation behavior. And we know that that outcome is sensitive to introduction of new labels across countries. We found a larger effect that has been found in other studies, but why didn't we see any effect um, for the psychosocial variables that should have mediated the association between labeling exposure and, and these outcomes? Um, that's something that we continue to scratch our head over. We're gonna show you some other data to help us think through it a little bit more. But one of the things that we've been talking a little bit about as a group is how, you know, maybe it's the reactivity to doing the EMA where people are, you know, having to log all of their different cigarettes and then we're exposing them to this messaging about not smoking at the very moment when they're being um, exposed, uh, when, at the very moment when they're satisfying their, their craving and their addiction for smoking. And there may be something about data collection in that moment in time that um, kind of messes with the signal a little bit. Um, but it's very clear that we also had this issue of um, relatively low or lower than expected statistical power because of the high ICCs that we found. The other thing that um, we can come back to if folks are interested in is that we didn't find any evidence that uh, including inserts and pictorial warnings um, did better than either one of those things alone. In fact, the data that we have suggests that the combination of the two of them, when we look at these EMA outcomes, 
um, may weaken the effect relative to either one alone, which again, could be something that we discuss as we move forward in the presentation today, particularly after I show you an, another set of analyses after we go through this initial round of questions. So I'm gonna stop there and I believe we're gonna open it up for some questions. Thank you so much, Jim. So first of all, we will turn it over to our discussant. I'm really pleased to say that our discussant today is Dr. Catherine Kate Clegg-Smith, a professor of health behavior and society from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Kate has been active in tobacco control research for over 20 years. For over a decade, her tobacco control research has included serving as PI of TPACS, which is the Tobacco Pack Surveillance System. TPAC systematically documents the variety of tobacco packages available in select low and middle income countries. So I'll hand over to Kate in case she has any comments or questions at this point. And I very much encourage people to enter things in the Q&A as well. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Jamie. And I just want to say thank you for this opportunity um, to uh, hear about this great work. And also just to say hello to Jim and his team. Um, we've been um, working um, uh, in similar areas for some time. And it's just, um, this is phenomenal work. And, and it's uh, just so interesting to see work that's been done, empirical work to uh, that's been done so carefully um, and that's so critically important. Um, and that's, um, I was so, and also to see the explicit um, application of theoretical work um, and thinking about um, these communication approaches with such clear ties to theory. So I'm just very excited about that. I don't wanna take up too much time. I wanna leave, um, uh, space for other people, but I, I was, um, I just wanted to make a comment about a few things. As, as Jim knows, we've been looking at um, the inter sort of um, outside of the U.S. Um, uh, packaging um, in other countries, and we've looked at inserts and um, a, a bit, um, and there. Um, and but what we haven't seen in other settings were, um, and we haven't looked at, at Canada, but. It's been the industry that's been using this space. So it's really interesting to think about um, the capacity for tobacco control to essentially increase the, the real estate that we have to communicate with these with the smoker. And think about the actual sort of physicality of you know, picking out the insert and the attention to that. So I think that's really um, very interesting to think. And also I the, this idea about it it being a different space, so the lack of sort of compelled speech and the ability to target messaging, I think that's just really, and thinking about differentiating sort of what might go on the package for the sort of a broader audience versus very targeted messaging. I think I'm hoping to maybe hear more about that in the next, um, and um, I was really interested in this idea of, you know, what's going on when you maybe have uh, sort of a weakened effect with with both the pictorial and the um, warning and the inserts. So looking forward to hearing more about that and also to thinking about what's going on with uh, with these um, heavier smokers um, and um, and whether there's different kinds of empirical work that might be needed as follow up work to figure out what specific efficacy messages might um, might be might be needed to sort of um, to change um, to sort of have an impact there. So anyway, just initial thoughts and looking forward to others' questions. Thank you so much, Jim. Did you want to respond to any of those, or shall I go over to our um, Q? &A? I mean, yeah. I mean, thank you for for your comments, Kate. I, I think the. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I think I just I'm glad that you're reinforcing this point that industry around the globe has been uh, using inserts to communicate with smokers um, about innovations, you know, about kind of incentive programs and promotions and, you know, potentially interfering with some of the health messaging that's on packaging in other countries. And so um, it feels like a real wasted opportunity to not be taking advantage of that space. Um, you know, obviously in the US, we have some particularities around First Amendment issues, but we hope that with some of the legal work that we put together, that um, some of the concerns that have been raised around the, the warnings on the outside of the pack can be kind of uh, circumvented by putting messaging inside of the packs. Although we haven't heard much about FDA doing any work in that space. Some of you may um, recall that 
in the the uh, the Kessler Ryko suit, um, the industry was obligated to communicate information with regard to um, uh, misperceptions that it had promoted around kind of lower risk of um, light. Um, cigarettes and uh, not owning up to different kinds of health risks that are associated with smoking. And you've probably seen, if you're in the U.S. context, that we're finally getting those messages at point of sale uh, around the country. Uh, I think every uh, legal point of sale must include some of these corrective messages. But the industry also was compelled to communicate that information through inserts to smokers. And so there was a time in the US about a year and a half ago where the smokers were being exposed to messages um, correcting misperceptions that were promoted by the industry through this um, particular medium. And so there's precedence for it even in the US um, when, the, when the legal system can get behind it. Um, and so you know that's always the big question that we have around here. Um, with regard to the heavier smokers, I'll just briefly say that I think the, um, you know, that is a tough nut to crack. And, and with communications, you can only do so much. Uh, and so one of the things that I think that is important to recognize about inserts and was a hang up point on the uh, around the pictorial warnings on the outside of the packs is that inserts could be where it is that you include information for smokers to get more resources. Um, and, you know, in conversation with some of the lawyers here in the U.S., I mean, one of the ways, rather than having it be exhorting people to quit, like 1-800-QUIT-NOW, we can have toned down phrasing, which is, you know, if you're interested in quitting, here are some resources for you. And so it doesn't phrase it as kind of compelling people to engage in that action, but it's recognizing that most smokers are interested in quitting. Um, and so telling them where they can go to get um, support that they need um, in order to increase the likelihood that they'll quit. So that, uh, there, there are some things like that that I think we need to recognize as well, that the communications can maybe be the starting point for some of that, um, but we need to have other systems in place to help people who are more addicted and maybe more disadvantaged experience other kinds of distressors that make it more challenging to quit. So I think I'll stop at that point. Thank you so much. James is doing a wonderful job answering questions in the Q&A. Thank you. So I'll just ask the one outstanding one currently, which is whether the participants were asked if they remembered any specific content of the messages and whether that awareness was different between the inserts and the pictorial warnings. Yeah, you know, we we they were asked that uh, we have we have a paper on the recall and it really um it, it's the um what people remembered from the inserts was they can save money if they quit and that there are these other health benefits that they get if they quit. Um, they were less likely to remember, kind of uncued, less likely to remember the cessation strategies um, that were communicated, the kind of tips to quit ideas. Um, but there were you know, reasonable proportions of people who also were able to recall those things. So yeah, there was some recall. Um, we haven't analyzed the data for recall, the pictorial warnings. We were less interested in that because it was a little less novel and it's been studied in other areas. And so we really wanted to hunker down in this other area that hasn't been studied as much. Interesting. Thank you so much. Let's hear more. Oops. All right. So moving on. Um, so the other paper that we... Uh, recently published its in press at NTR is looking at moderation of these effects um, by sociodemographic and psychological risk factors. And again, these were pre-registered. Uh, and so we felt an obligation to go through with evaluating these potential moderators of labeling effects, um, partly because of the, the, um, the, uh, the need to follow through with what it is that we said that we were going to do. But obviously, we have this additional consideration, which is the lower statistical power than we thought we were going to have. Um, and so one of the ways that we kind of addressed that as a team was that we limited this particular paper to looking just at the foregoing and stubbing out outcome, which was the one that had cropped up as kind of being the largest effect for the labeling conditions, both whether it was pictorial or the inserts that we were assessing. And so we, we looked at that particular outcome. And, and as I mentioned before too, it's also a, a relatively um, strong outcome to look at because of its consistent um, um, uh, ability to predict um, subsequent cessation attempts. 
So we looked at moderation by the variables that you see on the left there, and we evaluated them both as continuous variables and as binary um, uh, variables. And it didn't matter which way we sliced it, the results were pretty much the same. And what it is that we found is that in general, education moderated the impact of the pictorial warnings. And then time discounting moderated the effects of the, um, the insert um, um, exposures. And again, taking into consideration the relatively limited statistical power, baseline um, health literacy, quit intention, or self-efficacy did not uh, moderate labeling effects. And I'm going to show some slides that show kind of the, um, that help us wrap our heads around what these coefficients are really telling us. But the, the thing that I did want to mention is what is time discounting? I'm sure there are some people out there who probably don't know what that means. And it's it's really, and it, it's a behavioral economics term to try and get at the extent to which people value smaller immediate rewards relative to larger re rewards that they can um, receive later on. Um, and uh, Warren Bickle has done a lot of work in this area and has developed an algorithm for um, kind of determining where people are along a continuum of time discounting, where we ask people um, their preferences for some kind of monetary compensation now versus a different amount that's larger later on. And it keeps on kind of increasing the difference between the um, amounts of money and the length of time that one has to wait. And it puts you somewhere along this continuum after an you answer five different branching questions. So, um, I mean, in some ways, I think of it as being analogous to the idea of, you know, the immediate reward of satisfaction from smoking relative to the longer term health benefits of smoking cessation, which is the kind of thing that our insert messages were really trying to get at. So we'll take a look at how it is that um, the time discounting moderates the insert effects here in a second. Okay, so. Um, we stratified the data for, for education, and we looked at you know, whether people were exposed to pictorial warnings or not um, amongst those who had greater than high school education, and we see no effect of pictorial warnings. However, when we look at the group of folks who were high school education or less, including a pictorial warning on the pack, increased the likelihood that they were engaging in these, these behaviors of foregoing cigarettes that they would normally smoke or stubbing out. So it looks like there's a potential kind of health equity effect where this kind of a policy can have a bigger impact on people who are um, have lower levels of, of educational attainment. And when we looked at the contrast between having a picture on a pack with an insert versus um, an insert only, we see a similar, um, uh, uh, similar trend where the effect of the pictorial warning really seems to be limited to the people who are at lower levels of educational attainment. And that's consistent with what it is that we've seen in some other experimental and observational um, studies that have been done across a number of, a number of countries. Um, so for delay discounting, um, this, is, this is the other thing that um, cropped up as being statistically significant. So when people were exposed to inserts, that exposure was associated with foregoing of cigarettes only if they had low levels of delayed discounting. In other words, only if they uh, expressed the ability to wait for longer periods of time for larger uh, monetary re rewards, according to our delayed discounting measure. But people who had um, who had high delayed discounting, in other words, they were less interested in delaying um, to get a larger reward, the inserts didn't really affect them at all. Um, and then when we look at the people who were all exposed to pictorials, and then we see whether they're exposed to inserts or not, we see a similar kind of story, although it's it's a little weaker uh, pattern, but the, the interpretation ends up being pretty much the same. So um, we mostly found null effects again. I guess this is one of the struggles of this study is the, the null effects issue. Um, but neither pictorial warnings nor inserts, uh, insert effects were moderated by health literacy, quit intention, or self-efficacy, which I think in general is good. Um, that also needs to be tempered by uh, the reality that we have these concerns about interclass correlation, um, lower statistical power than we'd expected, and the sample tended to be heavier smokers who were under, uninterested in quitting. <clears throat> 
Um, and then, but the pictorial warnings appeared to be particularly effective for people who had lower levels of educational attainment. And so, as I mentioned before, this is consistent with research um, in other areas with other designs and suggests the potential for health equity effects of this kind of a policy. Um, again, we're just looking at foregoing. We're not looking at sustained cessation. We're not looking at um, actual abstinence, but this is a precursor to, to some of those um, behaviors. Um, and then the insert effects are really limited to the smokers with low delay discounting or those who had preferences for larger rewards later over smaller rewards now. And this is consistent with the cessation literature where interventions that involve contingency management and cognitive behavioral therapy have been much less effective if people have high delay discounting. So similar to what it is that we found. And so I think the, the folks who are in that, the smokers who have kind of high delay discounting, those are the folks who are gonna need more intervention um, to be able to actually help them quit smoking. And it's, it's a group that I think we need to continue to, to focus on and um, try and figure out how we can, can help them quit. Um, so this is the last study that I wanna briefly touch on before we open it back up. And so before I was talking about the EMA data that we collected every day, multiple times a day over the course of two weeks, here we just focused on the self-reported attention and responses to cigarette package labels at the end of the two week period. So after they finished their participation in the trial, we asked them how often they um, um, attended to and the different kinds of responses they had to the cigarette pack labels that were on the packs that we had given them. Uh, and as we might expect, um, relative to control, the noticing was higher um, across all groups. And a little bit different from what it is that we saw in our EMA data, the insert plus the pictorial warnings, um, people reported that we were, they were more likely to, to notice those um, compared to even the insert only and the pictorial only groups. And we tested for the statistical significance for that particular contrast. And then when we look at the frequency of reading the labels, kind of a, a, a deeper level of engagement with the message material, we see kind of a similar pattern. When we look at the frequency of thinking about smoking risks due to the labels, again, we see a similar pattern. Um, interesting that insert only also caused people to be thinking more about smoking risks, maybe because it's kind of the flip side of the um, benefits of smoking cessation. Um, and then the frequency of thinking about cessation benefits due to labels. Well, here's where the pictorial warning um, label condition was not statistically different from the control group. Maybe because the warning labels don't emphasize cessation benefits. Maybe it's, again, it's implicit, but it's not emphasized. Um, frequency of talking about labels, you see almost like a dose response there. And then the frequency of foregoing cigarettes due to labels. Well, that was the one thing that we were able to find some statistically significant signal in our EMA data, but when we turn to the self-report data, it's really only the people who are in the insert plus pictorial warning condition who um, have a statistically significant higher probability of foregoing cigarettes due, due to the label. So a little different picture of what it is that um, the labeling did for people um, compared to the EMA data. And then we ran in the context again of this kind of post experiment uh, survey, self-report survey data, we ran some mediation models where we looked at the extent to which attention was mediating the effect of the labeling treatment on the outcomes of interest. We averaged together the frequency of noticing and reading labels to form an indicator of attention. And you can see in the upper right-hand corner how it is that when, when the outcome was frequency of thinking about cessation benefits, that attention variable mediated the effect for inserts only and for the inserts plus pictorial um, warnings. In fact, it, it fully mediated the effect that it had on that particular outcome. Um, and then when we look across all the other outcomes that we assessed, it's the same kind of thing where the attention as a mediator really only explains the relationship between insert exposure and insert plus pictorial warning exposure um, relative to control and does not do so for the pictorial warnings. Um, we weren't powered to do this study, but it's interesting that this is cropping up in this particular way. Um, and so in conclusion, 
The inserts plus the pictorial warnings appear to be more effective than either of them alone, which is consistent with theory and empirical evidence. Attention mediated the effects of the insert or insert plus pictorial warning conditions. Although we found no um, evidence for mediation by attention for the pictorial warning um, effects, um, maybe that's because that messaging required less effortful processing um, because it was more pictorial and less text. Not entirely sure. That may help explain the issue. There's also the issue of power that I alluded to before. And then with regard to the inconsistency of the results compared to the EMA data analysis, that's something we continue to kind of grapple with. And you know, one of the things that's important to um, consider when contrasting these sets of results is that these surveys involve people attributing different um, behaviors and uh, psycho psychological responses to labels. And so people are having to engage in this mental exercise of connecting their thoughts and feelings um, and behaviors to uh, their understanding of exposure to the labels. Um, and so that is a different kind of cognitive process than just asking somebody about whether they're worried in this particular moment about the risks of smoking um, or whether they're um, feeling confident about their ability to cut down on the number of cigarettes that they smoke. And so we explicitly eliminated attribution to labels from any of the EMA uh, survey questions that we used that I presented in the first part of the presentation. And maybe this reflects in the end that um, recall, when people are self-reporting recall of exposure and its, its effects on them, that it is a better representation of the meaningful integration of the warning label content into their um, memory and might be more relevant to their actual this future decision making than the data that we can capture in kind of momentary um, uh, approaches that are around the moments when people are also smoking and maybe are more likely to be engaged in some cognitive dissonance because we're telling them they shouldn't smoke, but they actually are. Um, I think that to advance understanding of why this is happening, you need to think about other kinds of approaches that maybe would expose people to different ways of collecting data to try and understand whether it's the data collection approach itself that might be generating reactivity. The people who do EMA research, and I'm recently in, in that group, but the people who do EMA research will talk about how it, the evidence suggests that there's not a lot of um, reactivity among smokers, but maybe when it's combined with messaging, particularly messaging like we had where we have inserts and the pictorial warnings on the outside, that that generates a kind of reactivity to the actual um, um, study protocol itself and then affects the, the data that you get on the back end. But we need studies to understand that better. Um, I'll just briefly touch on a couple of extensions. One of the things that I like about the EMA data, and I don't know how many people have been presenting EMA data through TOPS, but you can really look at within-person variation. I mentioned before that there's the ICCs were relatively high, but there's still meaningful variation. We find that variation and all of the variables that we're interested in um, predicts behaviors, both within the same day and in the subsequent day. And we started to do some work where we're looking at um, both within person variability and between person variability as predictors of some of these behaviors. So this is an interesting graphic to kind of illustrate some of the work that we're doing where when people are feeling more positive about smoking compared to their own mean, um, self-efficacy to quit does not have an association with foregoing cigarettes the next day. However, when people are feeling more negative about smoking relative to their own mean, then self-efficacy to quit is, has a much stronger association or has a positive and strong association on um, foregoing cigarettes the next day. So there's some interesting things that we can do with regard to variability in the data that may help inform things like just-in-time adaptive interventions that I know people are increasingly interested in to promote cessation, particularly with hard to reach groups um, and people who are more addicted. We've also been doing some time varying mediation models. Um, and I'm actually gonna, just to make sure that we have enough time for some more questions, I'm gonna not spend a lot of time talking about it, but we can look at the trends in people's um, uh, 
uh, reports or over time in one group compared to another group and look at the extent to which some of these, um, the how it is that variables mediate um, the effects of the intervention on the behavior um, is a function of time. And that's also something that's really interesting, particularly if we want to get into the idea of how it is that the message effects could be wearing out over time. I'd be happy to talk about that a little bit more if others are interested. And then the last um, thing is that we can also think about putting other kinds of content on the inserts. Um, with Lucy Popova, we have a, an R01 that was funded earlier this year to look at messaging around very low nicotine content cigarettes um, for adults. And all the, the adults who we're gonna enroll into this trial are gonna be given the very low nicotine content cigarettes, but half of them are gonna be randomized to receive messaging about the very low nicotine content cigarettes. And um, some of that messaging is gonna be communicated through inserts, although it'll be supplemented with and kind of expanded upon by videos and ads that they're exposed to at their weekly visits. Um, and we've even done some pilot work trying to uh, evaluate whether we can use harm reduction messaging. Um, and uh, I can talk a little bit about that. This, this study was interrupted by something called a valley at one point. And so we're still kind of in the process of thinking about where this goes. But I think that there are some opportunities for all sorts of kinds of messaging that we could include inside of PACS, depending on the behavior that you're trying to promote. Um, and then finally, I'll say that in Canada, um, there is a new labeling policy that was just implemented at the beginning of this year. Um, and the project that I talked about earlier um, is also funded to evaluate that policy using a, a kind of an interrupted time series design that um, we've been collecting data for since about a year and a half ago. We've got a few more waves left. So hopefully we'll have more data to share next time I see you all. So with that, thank you very much. Um, and I'm happy to take any additional questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Thrasher. I'm going to hand over to Kate again as our discussant, and do keep on adding questions to the Q&A. If we don't get to them, they'll all be sent to Dr. Thrasher at the end. Great. Well, thank you, and thanks so much um, for more um, fascinating um, work, Jim, and there's just so much here. It's hard to, hard to know exactly where to start, but a couple of areas that I'd love to hear you um, talk a little bit more about. And the first was um, this idea of delayed discounting and the importance of that um, and um, and that as a as a sort of concept. And I, I wonder whether um, whether delayed discounting is a modifiable variable if that if that's something that people where there can be um, efficacy built up for people or sort of a change made for people or if that's just something that is a characteristic that that's something you have or you don't have. So I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, it's a great point um, because like I said, this is something that's not just been found for our intervention with the inserts, but also other kinds of interventions that in some ways are best practices for smoking cessation. Um, I'm not an expert in delayed discounting. Um, and but what I understand of the the concept in general is is that it is um, characterized as a relatively stable trait. Mm -hmm. um, I will say though that, that we've done some work where we use the same kind of Warren Bickle delayed discounting protocol, um, and we've looked at the um, test retest reliability of the results from one survey to the next survey three or four months later. And we find that they're not as highly correlated as would be expected based on this idea that it's a trait. Okay. Um, and there may be some cultural components to that as well, because the the data where the reliability or the, the um, test retest has the lowest correlation um, is in Mexico, for example. And so there may be sort of things that go on culturally with regard to how it is that people think about money and how people think about um, you know, what constitutes a large reward versus a small reward. Maybe that varies across contexts and there may be some other ways that, um, that we need to be measuring it in order to measure it well. But I mean, your point is well taken. In the end, um, can we modify it? Um, and you know, I think that's where I would imagine <laughs> that maybe people would be thinking about harm reduction strategies um, where you're not necessarily modifying the tendency, but you're giving a substitutable product that is less harmful um, in place of the thing that was more likely to satisfy that kind of immediate reward tendency. Um, you know, 
Yeah, that's that's what's that's top of mind for me right now in response to that very interesting and important question. Well, thanks so much for that. And I guess the other area that I really enjoyed hearing you talk about um, in the second half was the diff sort of your um, the the differentiation between the EMA findings and then the the labeling, the self report findings, and um, and the the idea of prompted recall um, and and the the in the EMA, the idea that these messages were sort of coming on top of sort of active smoking rather than sort of mindful sort of, or at least contemplation of quit and thinking about the impl sort of, I don't know, different interpretations of these findings um, based on those sort of, the fact that you're sort of, you're, you're capturing sort of different, different um, times and, and, and different actions in a, a sense. And I guess, I, from this body of work, which had somewhat different findings depending on how you how you measured things, is there one specific policy approach or that you would be most excited to see sort of tried as coming out of this sort of body of work? And then and then I'll pass it, pass it over to to others for questions. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. As as researchers often say, uh, well, I'd like to have some more research dollars to be able to explore this in greater detail. Um, I mean, the, the one thing that I would say is that I think there's a substantial body of evidence around the pictorial warnings and um, their ability to increase people's understandings of risk, particularly less well-known risks, which is one of FDA's mandates. Um, and I think that there's pretty solid evidence around um, uh, reducing cigarette consumption as well. Um, the effects aren't huge, but that we wouldn't expect big effects for a policy like this. Um, so I don't want to minimize um, that kind of body of research, which I think of as being pretty solid. Um, and so I think that research is already there. And, and I, I think that um, what it is that we're finding, if we triangulate kind of across the different ways of um, collecting data from people, is that there is added value to um, including additional information about resources and strategies to quit and cessation benefits. And, you know, in the qualitative work that we've done, some people like that kind of messaging more than they like the fear arousing messaging. So there's some preferences that we may be able to better tailor and target to um, if we have a variety of messaging. And um, I think sometimes um, what happens with the labeling messages too is that we know smoking cessation is kind of a dynamic process. And so we just talk to people 14 days or we collect the data over 14 days with novel exposures. You know, some of those exposures are gonna wear out, but when we look at the data that we have from our prior data collection effort in Canada, over the course of two years, we saw people's um, uh, engagement with and reading of the inserts go up over time while their engagement with the pictorial warnings on the outside of the packs was going down. And there were, they didn't cross over, um, so the, the kind of engagement with the pictorial warnings was always higher than what it is that we saw for the insert stuff. But I think that also reflects how it is that fewer people are in this kind of contemplation stage of quitting at any point in time. And there may be kind of recognition that once you get there, you know where to go to get some information that could be helpful. Um, and so I, I think that's particularly important. And, and to tell you the truth, as somebody who does a lot of work in, in other countries where, um, people have just used the pictorial warning label approach um, and where smokers don't necessarily have access to cessation resources, communicating that kind of information to me is uh, ethical um, to have it as kind of the counterbalance to the fear arousing messages. So um, yeah, that's, that's what I'll say. It looks like Jamie's getting on and maybe I need to move along. Yeah, thank you so much, Jim. We're at time now. Thanks for all the wonderful questions and comments we've received from Kate and others. And I'll hand over to Claire to close us out. Yeah, so we are out of time. Um, however, if you still have burning questions or thoughts for Dr. Thrasher, you can join us for Top of the Tops, an interactive group discussion offered immediately following select Tops events this season. So um, to join, please copy the Zoom meeting room URL that was posted in the chat, um, and you'll switch rooms with us once this event concludes. We'll leave the webinar room open for a few, an extra minute or so after the end to give everyone a chance to copy the URL, which is uh, bit.ly forward slash tops meeting, all lowercase letters. So thank you to our presenter, our moderator and discussant. And finally, thank you to the audience of 180 people um, for your participation. Have a tops notch weekend. <laughs>